let's get started uh, in interest of time. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Minnesota HIMSS webinar series. I'm Vitaly Herasevich, Professor of Anesthesiology and Medicine at Mayo Clinic and your host today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our today speaker and presenter, Tina Burbine. Uh, she is a, a Vice President of Care Innovation at Health uh, Link Advisors uh, Company, which is based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Tina has over 25 years of the value-based care per, population health and healthcare IT experience. And over her career, she is focused on the shaping the strategic approach of health system moving to value-based care, enable teams to focus on keeping their patient healthy, addressing uh, rising risk and improve of the health uh, of the those with chronic conditions through evidence-based cost-effective care delivery. Tina holds MBA, PMP, PG, MP, and multiple development tools stack uh, certifications. She serves on the Arizona HIMSS chapter board, lectures at the University of Arizona Biomedical Informatics College Fellowship Program, and hosts podcast called Let's Talk Data. Tina earned bachelor's degree from Northern Arizona University and MBA from the University of Phoenix. Today, she's going to talk about hospital and home, and also she's going to in, uh, introduce her co-speaker today, Cynthia Davis. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Cynthia Davis, um, I would love for you to share a little bit about your background and your role with the HealthLink Advisors team as well. I'm Cynthia Davis. I'm a nurse by original training, but I always like to say I'm a recovering chief uh, information officer. I have uh, worked in a variety of healthcare settings from acute care to home care to um, uh, uh, practice management, um, as well as accountable care organizations and helping organizations continue their transformation uh, to value-based care. I am uh, located in lovely Tampa, Florida. And uh, I'm really grateful to be here uh, talking with all of you. And first of all, I want to say congratulations for taking the time to continue to educate yourself through the Minnesota uh, HIMSS chapter. It's a deep commitment to your own career development that you're spending time learning more about this key uh, care wave, as I like to say, uh, the emerging work and the emerging care model of hospital at home. And welcome. We're happy to be here with you and want to answer your questions. So a little bit, here's our, again, our, our, our pictures. And um, we're going to talk a little bit today. We're going to define the concept of hospital at home because there's some very different uh, definitions these days. Outline why it's important to your organization or why you, if you're not thinking about hospital at home, why you should be getting to be thinking about hospital at home. Some of the incentives that are in the marketplace that are creating certainly an initiative that will help you help patients and families in a location that matters best to them. And we're also going to walk through some of the incremental steps that you can take to deliver this new care model and then review at a high level some of the key areas that you should be thinking about as leaders for using technology in your organization uh, to prepare for hospital at home readiness. So I wanna start a little bit and, and talk a little bit about a, um, a patient care story. I uh, have had the gift of, as a nurse and as an information technology executive of uh, supporting my elderly mother. And she lives at home in Michigan and actually lives far away from all of her children. Um, I live in Florida. I have siblings who live in Denver, Chicago and Washington DC. And that's because that's her choice. She loves her home. It's on 40 acres of farmland and uh, it's very comfortable to her. But she is beginning and at the age of 93 has some chronic conditions. She has uh, a touch of congestive heart failure, um, is beginning to um, have more problems with mobility and um, activities of daily living and has had another, a couple of other chronic health problems that have unfortunately taken her to the emergency room department more often than we, than we would care to admit. And so I was excited to learn that uh, the hospital that uh, she was being cared for 
was beginning to start a care program. And the reason I'm excited is because one of our experiences that we had is one night I got a call recently where I was told that my mother was being taken to the emergency room. And so she gets to the emergency room and she asks the nurse um, at two in the morning to call her daughter in Florida, who she gets on the phone and they uh, take some very initial information for me. They go into an EMR that's got a green and yellow uh, user interface and say, we can't find her. We can't find Mary Lou. And I said, she's been cared by this health system for over 20 years. What do you mean you can't find her? Well, we're going to have to set her record up again. And off they go. And they begin to ask my mother all of the same information that they've asked her um, before, including registration and, and allergies and her, her patient story. She got admitted. And then she, uh, it turns out they were able to find her record. But during her admission, it turns out she was eligible to be admitted into a hospital at home program, one in which they were going to send her home with additional support that allowed her to um, be able to have a telehealth visit on a daily visit uh, basis with a uh, physician and that she would have a paramedic who could come to her home and give her medications on occasion, draw her labs, and perhaps even uh, do some mobile uh, imaging. And so it was, uh, it's been an initiative that actually has prevented her from having to be readmitted. And so it made, made a real difference. And I also can participate in her telehealth visits as well. Knowing that it's such a difference from what her care was before has made a real change for us as her caregivers and her family support. So hospital at home is really being able to provide acute levels of care in the home care setting. And so very often, if someone needed regular monitoring interaction with a physician, maybe once or twice a day, um, some you know, initial medications, it meant that they had to either go to a outpatient setting or go and see an office visit where they sat in a waiting room. And instead, the care is coming to her and she's safe and she can she has a way to access caregivers immediately and also this is something that is uh, also at this point being reimbursed in some aspects by uh, CMS as well. Tina anything to add there? No I really appreciate you sharing that story and I I think it's a great description of what we mean when we talk about hospital at home these days. Um, so please continue. I think this is a great image. It, this is actually from Mount Sinai to show an additional example of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, hospital at home, that term, because it's newer for a lot of us in the industry and a lot of health systems originally started out focusing on treating COVID patients at home for good reason over the last year and a half, that term actually means a whole lot more in terms of the level of acuity of care. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of some um, health systems that we've had the gift to be able to work with, not only my own personal experience in caring for my elderly mother, but health systems that are looking at chronic conditions in certain populations. Uh, I'm sure in Minnesota, you have the same challenges with um, high levels of heart disease, potentially high levels of congestive heart failure and COPD. Those folks are also leveraging these kinds of programs for folks who are frequently readmitted. And so instead of them constantly having go, to go to the emergency department, they're able uh, to, blow, to deploy either a registered nurse or a field paramedic who can go in, assess them real time, um, have, leverage telehealth to also interact real time, be the hands and feet for a physician who uh, is in a more central location and then provide remote monitoring. So in my mother's case, um, she has the ability to be monitored, um, have a heart monitor. She also has a call button. It's actually a large screen that she's able to push the button um, and a nurse uh, appears from a central location 24 by seven. They take her vitals um, and she has a way to communicate with others and caregivers and also include the family in that conversation as well. It's been just a wonderful gift not to have to go uh, and take her to have mobile diagnostic testing or imaging in labs. And then there are also uh, services that are bringing uh, both Meals on Wheels or different medications as well. And then 
Um, I have a clinical background, but my siblings do not. And so there's been additional caregiving uh, training that's been provided uh, to us as well. And so it's a very, it's a very holistic, patient-facing, patient-first type of experience. So why does it matter now? So certainly, you know, we've been on this journey for well over 20 years. I was um, sharing before the call started that um, uh, some of the early, my early experience in leveraging technology was um, helping um, health systems put in the first emerging electronic medical records in uh, CPOE. And I think how far we've come. We now have strong technology platforms, but it, with COVID, certainly it's, um, I think, sped up and we're seeing across the country the speed of changing, change uh, being supported and driving even more value-based care models and payments. Because now we've learned we can do it. We can be agile, we can move quickly, and frankly, we should be incentivized as healthcare systems to provide high quality, safe care in the right location. And so when clients talk to Tina and I about, you know, what do I need to be thinking about in order to make uh, the transitions of care safe? We always say, let's not really use the words, you know, we're trying to reduce readmissions because what we're really trying to do is provide the right care in the right location. And we all know patients and families we all prefer to be sleeping in our own beds and being cared for by our, and having our family support around us. There's nothing more lonely. And frankly, that taught us uh, in the last 18 months with COVID, we're being alone in a space where you can't hold the hand of your family and friends. And certainly there's a lot of market pressure. Um, we know that there's not more money coming into the healthcare delivery system. And then we've also got to be operationally far more effective and make sure we're providing the right tests, the right services, the right medications that are going to meet the need. And certainly we've learned with COVID that there's a great deal of hospital bed capacity. I was talking to someone earlier today who uh, they were really trying to build a model of multidisciplinary care in a med surge unit. And one of their challenges is if they could just have maybe a half day longer of a stay, completing more of the real-time education. And there is such, they were running close to 99, 95, 99% full capacity in their beds that, you know, that being able to shift some of this real-time education in a telehealth uh, manner in a hospital at home program was, it was helping to, uh, uh, to relieve some of their hospital bed capacity issues. Tina, any comments? You know, I just, I think about how much the industry has changed and the opportunity that all of our health systems have been prevented, uh, presented with. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's some really exciting reimbursement opportunities now that are driving care in the home to think beyond COVID. So very helpful when the pandemic um, began and it's been helpful over the last year and a half. But when we think about uh, the, the reimbursement opportunities and the way that we can deliver care in the home, um, you know, the payers see the value of this. And so we need to think beyond uh, just the COVID um, condition type to support patients in the home with the care that they need. So let's incorporate our value-based care contracts um, and think about hospital in the home being far different, very distinctively different compared to what we consider to be traditional home health. I think that's an important point that we want to make as we talk through this, because I think it's very easy to think that the term hospital at home um, is correlated directly with traditional home health care. And we want to be careful because even though, yes, we're talking about providing the framework for patients in their homes um, and to their families as well, we're really talking about a very different acuity level um, to support those patients being able to stay in their homes safely, heal better, faster, you know, all the things that the data supports. And in fact, Cynthia, if we move forward, um, I love talking about the fact that, you know, this hospital at home care, it sounds very bleeding edge to all of us, but it's actually been a standard of care, you know, that's been around outside of the US for a long time globally. So it's only the reimbursement opportunities that have been brought forward 
that actually propelled this um, in terms of the maturity, you know, across the U.S. to be considered a newer standard of care. So it's an exciting time. Um, you know, a lot of the EHRs that we are familiar with do support hospital at home workflows in the international market as well. And now with the embracing of CMS and the payers following suit, you know, we're actually on the brink of this becoming a standard of care here as well. Um, we have so many uh, health systems across of the US that have been approved and are continuing to gain approval. I love the Mayo Clinic story. It's near and dear to my heart because their focus was originally to serve COVID patients. We know there was a high volume by Mayo supported in caring for their patients at home. And we also love the fact that the Mayo team focused on hospital at home care is now focusing on expanding that program to support conditions beyond COVID. So it's the next step in their own maturity as, as, as that team continues to build this type of care delivery pathway. And it's very exciting to hear about. And Tina, I would also say there's a number of creative um, options being vetted and it really is what are some of your local needs. I talked recently to a health system that's actually beginning to move some of their monitoring of uh, pregnancy, high acuity pregnancies, um, into the hospital at home program, allowing women who might uh, otherwise be admitted or have to go to an outpatient setting for monitoring medication a couple times a day, actually bring that back into the home uh, and making it a, a better experience. And others looking at how can we um, support the pre-surgical process and perhaps more post-surgical monitoring in the home instead of and bringing those services to the home instead of having patients um, stay longer uh, in the acute care setting, therefore freeing up capacity. So I think, you know, the chalkboard, it, it's a whiteboard that is open to um, lots of different areas based on the needs of your patient population and your community. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always come back to the data, which is, you know, we know that all of the research shows that caring for our patients, you know, they heal faster, they do better in their own homes. You know, Brigham, John Hopkins, we can main, name so many more that, that actually has the research behind this and shows, hey, look, the total cost of care, you know, ranges from a 35 to 40% savings compared to inpatient bed care. So it's a, these are staggering statistics um, and we know it works. So, you know, when we think about um, in addition to lowering the total cost of care and then layering in things like the value-based care growth opportunities that exist, there's a really uh, huge opportunity for teams to improve your performance with a reduction in the length of stay, lowering your readmissions um, and avoidable ED visits, you know, lowering your SNF admissions. Um, all, all of these kinds of things that are very exciting that we know the clinical teams have been working so hard to try to accomplish. Um, so this is a great pathway that can help the teams do that. So, you know, combining the combination of the CMS reimbursement and the new payer models with the savings, all of those things combined means it's possible to create a care in the home model that is a financially sustainable one and two. You know, the payers understand this and they like the fact that it, you know, continues to drive down the total cost of care and they're entering the market also. Um, so many payers, you know, we've heard in the last year have invested or have acquired companies that are going to help them enter this space. Um, I recently got a call from my dad who was confused about an in-home visit that his Medicare Advantage payer was offering him and he had reached out to me to say, hey, how is this going to correlate to my regular doctor's visits that I'm going to? And so I had to, you know, take him through the understanding what the differences were. Um, so our friends in the, in the payer industry are focused on providing this kind of care too. And we really believe strongly that we want to see our health system succeed in establishing this type of care um, so that you can continue caring for your patients in a new way. Um, when we think about, you know, all of the different services that can be provided to patients in the home, you know, there's um, a robust amount of services like, you know, an intimate 24-7 um, communication 
and services that also equal reimbursement opportunities. So there are 60 plus DRG, codes, you know, labs, pharmacy, um, respiratory care, medical supplies, um, physical occupation, speech therapy, you know, medication delivery, home infusion, diagnostics, radiology, nutrition, you know, all of these different things. And those all represent, of course, things that these patients need, but we need to account for them um, uh, in order to create a financially sustainable program. So something that we feel very strongly about is as a team is establishing this type of care delivery pathway, that a team takes the time to establish a financial model that summarizes your total internal program costs with a cash flow view to visualize what the program's break even point is. And it accounts for all of the reimbursement opportunities in the services being provided as well, right? So by establishing that program cost model very early um, in the innovation of the workflows for care at home, you know, the organization is strategically positioning itself to identify the program development costs and the benchmarks for cost efficiency that are going to help you drive scalability. This is a really important component of ensuring that a team is creating a long-term financially sustainable program approach for this kind of care delivery. Um, and we want to make sure in that cost model that, you know, we're representing our operating, our capital, our variable, our fixed costs, all of those types of things. Um, and this is also a great way to leverage that model and really evaluate, you know, the internal cost of building out these services versus partnering with somebody and, uh, and outsourcing either a component or multiple components of your care at home model. And um, that allows you to understand the impact of those decisions on revenue. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier that this is now becoming a new standard of care across the US. And of course, a critical element is establishing the new care delivery models with, you know, how clinical innovation works. So Cynthia, do you want to describe how a successful cycle of, of clinical innovation, what the key elements are? Absolutely. When we, you think about putting the steps, the framework in place in order to successfully in, initiate a clinical innovation, you really need, first of all, to have your senior leadership come together and align around a vision and a mission. What is it you want to accomplish? What are the guiding principles that say, um, you know, we want to be able to provide the right care in the right location. You ne they need then to empower a core team who's going to go and make it happen. Part of what we find so critical to success is to really understand where your care management processes are happening in the organization. So often, legacy teams have created, whether it be on the inpatient care management side or in the practices or in your accountable care organization, or in your home care uh, partner, or if you provide home care yourself or your skilled nursing facility, they're all reaching out to the patient, frankly, to try to coordinate care. And so to Tina's earlier point, sometimes they get a very uh, you know, mixed message, who's calling me and what's going on. And so it's important to really understand the current state of where care is being managed in your health system. So we always ask or, or suggest that you should do a very um, detailed inventory, understand what your current um, in care management assets are for your organization and then come together to really begin to bring them together as a team. You then, as you're looking at what population you're going to target, ensuring that you understand what's your area of greatest need, you know, whether it be OB patients or folks with congestive heart failure or COPD, identify that patient population, determine how you're going to stratify that risk um, you want, if your goal is to really provide care in the right location at the right side, you want to be able, and I know many of you in Minnesota use um, Epic, uh, there are tools within that that uh, solution that allow you to, and risk models that allow you to um, identify who's at greatest, at highest risk, and who's at emergency at emerging risk that you need to really, you know, look at how are you going to um, not only intervene when they arrive at the emergency department, frankly, um, manage their 
uh, services and health on an ongoing basis. And then it's important also to develop clinical protocols. We know that reducing variation in the clinical process leads to care success. And so spending the time um, getting your providers on board uh, with uh, some clinical clinical standardization. And then determining, I always say, you can't start on a journey until you know um, what the end is in mind. And so how are you going to measure your success? You can't move forward until you really understand, you know, what is it that you want to accomplish? And then you can drive, certainly, um, identifying your population and looking at the staff model. Some states allow for paramedics uh, in, in the home. Some states uh, allow or require it to be an RN. And to Tina's earlier point, this is not just the same old home care. And it, Traditionally, when we find, and with greatest love and respect to my home care partners, that they have, because they've had such strict reimbursement guidelines and what is considered, you know, only so, so many visits on a homebound status, it's really um, looking at and helping the teams across the continuum, whether you be on the acute care side, you're in the practices, you're in an accountable care organization, you're in a home care, you're in SNF to come together and use the right level of services and, and staff support to provide, these, uh, to provide these services. And then frankly, launch, making sure you understand in great detail how to identify the patient, how to bring them into the program, what are gonna be the workflows when you initiate them, um, how do you get them, and if you've got you know, certainly um, you know, a schedule, what's your response time for getting out to provide services? We work with providers who are really very heavily leveraging this to make sure patients who are coming into the emergency room are not necessarily um, admitted, but in fact, connected real time into a mobile uh, care program where a paramedic is being sent out within the next three to four hours. And so, you know, what are going to be those operational standards and workflow that are specific to your community and to your healthcare setting? And then make sure you've got your, your uh, experts in analytics and reporting, helping you have some real-time reporting that allows you really to understand, you know, how you're going to get to uh, the end in mind. And then certainly, and not the least item though, I always tease Tina, she worries about the money, I worry about the patients, and actually both of us work, worry about both, but um, you know, you have opportunities, and certainly with Minnesota being such a very heavy managed care market, um, to partner with your payers um, in order to develop and deliver this care, and we encourage health systems to do this as well, because we're finding many of the payers are getting into this business, and so as you're looking at it, um, most health systems, you know, they like to keep the revenue. And so, uh, you know, making sure that if there is a revenue opportunity that you are capturing it and not competing with your, your payer, or we found organizations that are able to get grant funding to start up these programs for their payers because the payers see the value and they want to be able to support your innovation as well. Yeah. I would, uh, one more thing to add when I think about clinical innovation that's really meaningful, you know, Cynthia and I run into a lot of clinicians and physicians who want to obviously ensure the safety of their patients in a home setting. And when we think about the mind shift change that some folks um, experience when we think about all of the different factors that are very unique to providing care in the home, you know, we talk a lot about being able to support clinical innovation by through the use of simulation training. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is something that is extremely valuable in, in any really new care delivery model that's being established for the team. So something that we're very passionate about is that, you know, care in the home is an exciting opportunity for us now, but we also want to position our leadership teams and to be able to guide uh, our, the teams that we work with every day so that we can continue working in an innovative fashion and being ready for the next care delivery improvement that we're going to make together. So understanding that clinical innovation and creating these new care models um, and the process and being comfortable with the continuous cycle of improvement, because that's, that's what's most meaningful um, for our teams and the care of these patients and continuing to strive for the types of organizational improvement that that we're all looking for. 
Love talking about technology too. So uh, virtual raise of hands here. How many are familiar with the concept that a lot of the EHRs in the market today actually have some sort of workflows that support a care in the home or hospital at home approach? Does that surprise anybody? So because um, to Cynthia's point earlier, we know that Epic is a, is a very well leveraged um, EHR in across Minnesota. You know, Epic's a great example um, to highlight about this. You know, they did actually create um, what's, they have a label for it called a turbo package, but that was actually created uh, as a way to document patient encounters in a field hospital outside of the four walls of a traditional hospital during the height of the pandemic last year. Those workflows support the same type of encounter information that we need to be worried about um, as, as what's needed for an in-home care setting. So that is a very easy way to take advantage of something that's available today by Epic and many of the other EHRs as well. Um, those workflows are based on an inpatient build um, and it's very important to understand that it's a very quick configuration timeline if this is something that your team is not already using. Um, and you can very easily build reports and analytics from this. Now, because those workflows are available and they're newer to the market, there are some gaps that we wanna make sure teams keep in mind and can plan for accordingly as well. Um, you know, a great example of that um, is that for all of the types of pa uh, needs that a patient is going to have, whether it's, you know, patient identification, enrollment and registration, scheduling, you know, dispensing and routing the medications, the imaging, the labs, the outpatient orders, all of these types of things that are going to be appropriate in the care for a patient in a hospital at home uh, program. You know, we need to be sure that we're capturing all of those services and that has to happen if it's a non-DRG code service uh, in, in a manual order. And so that type of uh, manual order entry needs to be accounted for in the operational staff model too. Um, those are very important components. I know nobody enjoys hearing there are some manual workflows to have to document, but if those services aren't entered accordingly, there's going to be a loss in terms of the revenue cycle um, component that is an important part of building a financially sustainable program. So we wanna be aware of these um, gaps and knowing of course that over time we expect the, the EHR vendors and the third parties in this area to mature, um, but it's really important to understand um, the things that we need to account for today so that operationally we can be successful in, in providing the care to those patients. So thinking about again, the key readiness for key items for uh, that need to be addressed to ensure your readiness. First of all, creating a vision for how you want to pr provide care to your patients, families, and community, making a decision whether you're going to build those capabilities internally with your own care management teams, uh, EHR, um, and solutions, or you're going to buy one of those solutions in the market. And one of the things that we help organizations do is really uh, look at the total cost of ownership of making or buying and when will you have a return on investment and, and how can you best leverage, you know, which approach is best for your organization. There are pluses and minus. Oftentimes, if you buy a lot of those solutions, you end up uh, releasing some of your reimbursement, but it all, also is a quick and easy or an easier way to immediately um, bring a lot of um, agile innovation in place. But if you've got an organization that works very quickly and is responsive to be able to make those kinds of changes and can leverage your existing re internal resources, it's a much more cost-effective model. Creating also a culture of innovation. These kinds of changes require that you're not thinking about this is the way we have always done it, but thinking, how can we do it differently? You know, we can try some things um, if they don't necessarily work. And I'm not talking about impacting the safety of patients at home, but we are very big advocates of trying quickly. Um, if it doesn't work, 
make a change, continue to, to improve. And that is a mindset change that should be supported and, re and uh, leveraged by your senior leadership. And then again, um, driving towards an enterprise care management. I once worked with an organization that had across their entity of eight hospitals, had 150 different care management meetings. Almost 40% of those were talking about the same patients. Think about how you could free up a lot of capabilities in your organization instead of having those number of hours spent care managing the same patient and reaching out to the same patient. Uh, you could uh, be able to do a lot more innovation and frankly, have a better experience for patients and families. And then determining, you know, where, what are your in-home services to our earlier point about the, the wide range. Are you going to make those or are you going to buy them? And are there, you know, vendors in your marketplace that can be suppliers or are you able to be your, you know, home medication uh, dispensary uh, service or do you need to partner with, with another third-party provider? Having your IT team in lockstep with you from the very beginning in order to be able to support what technology do we need uh, in order to hardwire the new process. What is your staffing model? Can you leverage some of your existing resources and uh, people? Uh, I need to be, you know, I always sort of laugh at myself when I say, when I call people resources, I shouldn't do that. And so my apologies. I'm really uh, leveraging your, your existing team members with their knowledge of patients and families and allowing them some new opportunities to do some great new things. And certainly having home health uh, at the table, having them there from the beginning. Oftentimes we hear from home care agencies, we just don't get brought in until the end. And then it's hard for us, um, first of all, to understand what is it you expect of us? And then also how can we be part of that culture of innovation as well? And then working with your managed care teams in your organization to understand, are there some opportunities to partner with payers or might we be able to approach a payer and ask for uh, some additional uh, grant funding or startup funding to be able to provide this care as well. So we've also created a maturity model and we, uh, these slides will be shared with you, but certainly you can do, you know, a beginning um, sort of a high level assessment to really understand where are you on the road uh, to a hospital at home care delivery model. Are you just at this point providing traditional home care? Uh, do you have a vision and do you have a core team that can help you drive this care delivery? Um, how are you identifying which is the population that you need to uh, be driving to improve? And what are the criteria you're using uh, to, uh, to define that patient population, not just in the acute care setting, but across the entire continuum of care? Do you have, um, you know, do you have a field paramedic or an RN program with basic, you know, caregiver communication protocols, technologies, and tools in place? Do you have your overall digital uh, and virtual supply chain um, automation? How are meds gonna be delivered at the home? How are you going to have providers talking or doing a telehealth visit on a daily basis with those who are in the hospital at home program? How are you going to leverage those existing strong pair par partnerships to optimize that? And, you know, making sure, you know, with starting with the mindset, starting with the end in mind, how are you going to have savings and how are you going to uh, demonstrate success in the organization about your overall reduction in patient total cost of care and document things like you know, improved HCAP scores or improved overall patient satisfaction with your health system? Because I know you're all working on um, in improving your patient experience, whether you're in the acute care setting and you're in the practices, you're in home care, you're in a SNF. We really, I think one of the big drivers and continued lesson learns from COVID and uh, work that came before was, you know, how are we focusing to make the patient experience and family experience easy and satisfying? So know where you are. And, you know, it's not bad if you're at level one, you've got a starting point, you know where you need to get to. So questions, questions for us or Tina, any other additional comments? You know, there have been some interesting uh, questions and comments shared. Um, so I think let's take a minute to, uh, to, uh, to talk through those and then hopefully we'll have a few more questions um, provided as well. 
you know, when we talk about resource sharing, um, what do we mean by that? And what are some examples of different roles across the health system that could be pulled into a hospital at home staff model? I think a good example is care managers. So if you have care managers in your accountable care organization and care managers in your um, acute care setting, they may be focused on very different things, but always focused on the transition of care for a patient. So pulling those kind of resources, or if you've got a physician who has typically been um, doing uh, primary care, repurposing that primary care physician uh, who is part of the health system to go and to be one of the telehealth visits, repurposing your ED uh, physicians who are typically waiting for patients to come into the emergency room, repurposing them also to be potentially um, providers who are interacting on a daily basis with patients at home. So using your existing assets uh, to currently uh, to provide this new care delivery model. Does that make sense? Uh, th thank you, Tina. Thank you, Cynthia, for presentation. Yeah, that's very interesting and good. Yeah, good organized uh, information and so. On. Yeah, I I have one question uh, before. Yeah, people. Yeah, there are, looks like there is in Q and A one question is open. But before that, I ask you because this is Hims. It's a actually technological forum, and my question is. Uh, what about technology? Is this technology ready? And we have only administrative and more psychological barriers for that, or some technology need to be developed to have a care at home program successful. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I, Cynthia, are you okay if I start? And I'm absolutely. Kind of, you have yes. many thoughts on this as well. So, you know, from a technology perspective. You know, we touched a little bit on the IT enablement plan for Care at Home, which is starting to use the workflows that a, that a system has access to through their EHR. Um, but with the gaps that we mentioned, you know, there are third party vendors that a health system is going to have to use for support for things like automating the supply chain, um, um, you know, figuring out how they're going to integrate the real-time data alerts for any technology provided to a patient in the home, um, maintaining that patient registry, um, you know, the type of regulatory reporting around the metrics for the program success um, that are really important to teams. Those things we need to account for. And so there are third party vendors in the market from an IT perspective that can supply, um, I call it bolt-on technology to support a hospital at home program. So it's really important to do your due diligence and understand what information and workflows you can sustain in the package from the EHR that's being used and then uh, clearly identify the supplemental technology that's going to be needed and integrate it with the EHR, of course, uh, to continue building and expanding the hospital at home services. Yeah, this is probably, I, uh, probably a clarify a little bit question. Uh, yeah, the, is this technology already exist and uh, programs need to choose and pick what they want or this technology need to be to develop it just around the corner, but it's still not there. No, it actually, I'm glad you clarified that. It does actually exist. Um, I will, I will uh, share that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of remote patient monitoring vendors are starting, have uh, expanded into services far beyond just RPM. So uh, my cautionary tale about saying, yes, the technology that you hear us talking about here today does exist but it's really important to do your due diligence to understand the nuances of the platforms that they're each built on, how that integration is going to work with your systems, and if they have the capability of continuing to expand the technology, because that's their product roadmaps will make a difference to how your programs can grow and mature as well. Um, so we wanna be smart and as cost efficient as we can. So take advantage of what you have under your umbrella now, 
and then outline your requirements so that you can do a quick vendor evaluation and select from all of the market opportunities that exist and find the right bolt-ons to supplement what's needed. Cynthia, I know you always have more thoughts on this, so please share. And I share. think, yeah, I think it's, again, you've got to really understand what your workflows are, do your gap analysis against your existing EHR, and then determine, you know, is there a, you know, there are numbers of tools that are out there that are out there supporting this workflow. You've got, you know, you've got digital stethoscopes, you've got telehealth stuff, you've, you know, all of that. And so, and then to make your selection uh, based on what are really the gaps that you need. But I'm going to, I concur with Tina. There's a lot of technology out there currently yeah. gap wise to be able to support this. And a number of vendors are available. Yeah. I think if even you, though, yes, we are all technology fans. We all love, you know, trying out something that's newer to the market. It's so important to keep in mind. And Cynthia and I talk about this almost daily lately, which is you have to understand what the clinical care workflow is going to be for the team in order to use that and define the requirements for the technology. Um, you know, taking the approach where we're using technology to define the workflow, ooh, creates a lot of heartburn, doesn't feel so good. So let's be mindful about all of the hard work that our clinical teams are doing, define that workflow, how that's going to work in caring for the patient and leverage that workflow to define the requirements for what needs to be technology enabled. Thanks. Yeah, it looks like we have a question in Q&A panel. Uh, can you address that? Yes, I think it's a, a comment about the reimbursement for telehealth setups for patients at home um, with tablets, laptops, um, since many older patients may not have access to that type of technology. Um, I'll first start by saying that, you know, there are so many different RPM vendors on the market that actually have different packages that uh, they can partner with a health system to provide. And that even comes, uh, it can address the different maintenance and um, support for the patient as well, so that it relieves the burden from the clinical and IT teams of a health system. Um, I believe that the, that statement was actually getting to a question about what are the reimbursement opportunities and we wish that there were more around telehealth and RPM. Um, there are actually quite a few uh, reimbursable opportunities for providing those packages to the patients. And it's really important that when we're developing a cost model for a program um, to account for what your internal contract rates are with the vendor you're partnering with and to account for the ongoing monthly monitoring fees that are associated with that so that you can offset it both with your reimbursement opportunities, any investment funding that's coming in the door and your new payer reimbursement opportunities specifically as well. Okay, is there any more questions from audience? All right, yeah, if we have no more questions, we probably return back eight minutes uh, to everyone. And again, thank you, Tina. Thank you, Cynthia, for this such presentation. And uh, thank you, audience, for attending this. Yeah, we, you know, we really appreciate being here with, with all of you today. You know, we genuinely want to see your organization successful in establishing your care at home programs. Um, and it's an exciting time for all of us to be innovating um, and knowing that, you know, our patients prefer to be in their homes. So if there's anything we can do to support you and your teams as you continue growing your care at home programs, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to have a conversation and share any lessons learned. And also we're both on LinkedIn. That's a great, great way to connect with us. Um, please, uh, please let us know how we can be of service. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.